anybody that thinks this is a done deal that you know that but Trump can't win, he can win again. Nobody thought he could win in 2016. And I'm going to tell you, if he does get through and he wins this time, he's going to interview 100 candidates for attorney general and only take the one that says, like, Mr. President, I'm, in essence, I don't care what the Constitution is. I'm going to do whatever you want as your servant in the Department of Justice. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. It is Halloween, and I don't need you don't need me to tell you that it's pretty scary out there. So we are joined by Adam Kinziger, former congressman from Illinois, whose new book, Renegade, Defending Democracy and Liberty in Our Divided Country, is out today. So first of all, Adam, thank you for making the time to be with us, because I see that you're pretty much everywhere this week. Yeah, Appreciate but you know it. what? The Bulwark Podcast with Charlie Sykes. I mean, who couldn't be there, you know? Plus, now that I get to see you, it's like a it's handsome, overwhelming Okay, so uh, you know, one of the things, uh, there, well, there's a lot of things we need to talk We need to talk about uh, the new fifth string speaker. We need to talk about uh, the war in the Middle East. We need to talk about uh, your critique of, of politics. But what I really was struck by about your book, let me give you my, my short re- review, is that I, what I really appreciated was how raw it was, how personal it was, and how open you were about um, the, the, the transition um, you know, the, the, the way that you had bought into a lot of this and are admitting that you were part of this as, as I was, um, and, and you, you had a very interesting soundbite yesterday. I want to just just play this. You were on CNN where, where you're a contributor now with Anderson Cooper, and you told this little story. Listen to this. So I had family that sent a certified letter disowning me. They said, I've lost the trust of great men like Sean Hannity, which is funny, but they believe that. Okay, so talk to me about that, Adam, because I think what a lot of people forget is that people who became renegades in the Republican Party, it wasn't just a political matter, that there was a personal cause. And you had your own, tell me about this, you had your own family send you a certified letter. I mean, yeah, I mean, what happened? We talked about brain worms. This is (laughs) brain worms. So. Like, you know, I lived in Shanahan, Illinois, and I would go down and visit my folks in Bloomington maybe once a month, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I go down on this once a month journey, and it happens to be the time that my dad's basically his kind of cousins, big, a big group of them. Okay. The certified letter shows up to me, to my parents' house. I'm yeah. like, oh, okay, well, interesting, good timing. And I start reading it, and the first two words were, oh, my, and I was, you know, naive enough to think they were going to be like, oh, my, how brave you have been. And it says... Oh my, what a disappointment you are to us and to God. That was how it opened. Mm -hmm. And then it just went on. You've lost the trust of great men like Sean Hannity, Mark Levin, and like a few others in there. And I'm like, you know, if you ever wonder if it's a cult, all you have to do is just look at what is the thing that they are upset at me about. And it wasn't much about principle. It was all about losing the trust of great men like Sean Hannity. And, you know, and yeah, you know, I laugh about it because to me it is just so ridiculous, but since I got out of Congress, you know, I use the analogy of nobody has PTSD while they're in combat. It's yeah. when you're out and it's, it's been kind of coming to grips with the impact that's had. And, and, you know, things like my co-pilot in Iraq, you know, one of the guys I should be closest with sending me a text a year ago that says he's ashamed to have ever flown with me and ever served really? with me. Why? Yeah. Why? Cause I don't know. Cause I told him the truth about January 6th or, or I'm not in this cult. And yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a real impact. And it's not, I tell a lot of the, my story, I wasn't even the one that released that letter, by the way. She's so yeah. crazy that the one that led that, that she released it somehow thinking it would turn people. But you know, it's, I say that because everybody's got a story like yeah, that. Yeah. Everyone's and, got a and story. And I'm sure like Thanksgiving is going to have the more, even more. Yeah, exactly. Let me read you a passage from, from your book. This is actually from the introduction when I was talking about that. It was kind of raw. Um, this is what I was thinking of when I, when I first read the book, you write, I feel some responsibility for January 6th and the rise of Marjorie Taylor Greene and her ilk, if only because I was a participant in and witness to the GOP's gradual descent into a dysfunctional and destructive force in our politics, intoxicated by my status and addicted to the level of attention. I made compromises to, let's face it, feed my ego and sense of importance. The correction I made as I embraced my inner renegade and voted to impeach a president of my own party came late, but it did arrive. 
Now, this is one of the things about politics that I think that people um, that, 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 that people don't fully understand, which is just the role of status and ego. I mean, I remember years ago reading John Dean's book where he was talking about how, you know, in the Nixon White House, you know, how he you know, got sucked in. And he tells the story of being on an airplane. And when the airplane lands, the Secret Service or the marshals come on and say, Mr. Dean, you know, we want to get, you know, have you come out first because you're such an important guy? And that goes to your head. So this is part of it, because as people are trying to figure out, why do people make these compromises? So talk to me about that passage, because that uh, that was that that's that's pretty personal that you actually say I was part of this and I made these compromises because I I wanted to stay important. Yeah, I mean, it's it's I think it's essential because if you look at let's let's take somebody like uh, Elise Stefanik, okay? yes. who was this paragon of normalcy, this, you know, icon of, you know, the in the ilk of Paul Ryan. And literally, she wasn't one of those that took a few years to change. She literally on a dime. It was just like, you know, because what happened with her was, and I think it was the impeach, the first impeachment or something, she came out in defense of, of Donald Trump. And I think she legitimately believed her defense. Mm -hmm. But then she got all kinds of accolades from the people she desperately wanted it from. Right. And realized all of a sudden, oh, I can I can be famous this way. And and she is. I mean, she's arguably yeah. considered for vice president. And so, you know, from my experience, it was like, so 2011, you know, I go on, I'm on Face the Nation as a freshman. My goodness. I go on Fox News. I was on uh, Greta Van Susteren's show every Monday for, I think, a period of about six months to a year. And every time you, you know, take your earpiece off, take the mic, shake the hand of the host and walk out, the first thing you do is pull out your cell phone because it's been yeah. buzzing the whole time. And it's all your friends telling you how great you are and how awesome it was to see you. And then you, the first time you get recognized at the airport and somebody wants to get their picture taken with you, it's all very intoxicating. It's like a drug, right? It's like, um, it's like nicotine. You want, you take a little, you want more, you want more. And, uh, and it's only when you can recognize that and break with it and all of a sudden say that your soul is more important and your legacy is more important than that. Can you recognize it? But I think too many people have instead said my legacy has to be the fame and I can't think of myself without it. So it's, yeah, it's a very raw and, and, and very human admission, but I think it's one that frankly affects almost anybody in politics, whether they admit it or not. And yet, and yet you're, you're more famous now than ever, right? Yeah, kind of unintentionally. Have, have, having yeah. done, ha, un, unintentionally, having lost uh, you know, members of your family in the respect of, of, of God and, uh, and apparently. <laughs> um, but so w what was the breaking point for you? You were a conservative Christian uh, who, who ran because you were inspired by Ronald Reagan. You were you know, very much in that tradition. I mean, you go back to 2011. And you were you were you were one of the one of that class of tw of 2010, right? I mean, you were comfortable with mm -hmm. the Tea Party. You were comfortable with C Christian conservatives. You thought of yourself as being very much part of the mainstream. What was the moment you said, "I'm I'm I'm willing to break with that. I'm not going to be part of that. I'm going to give all that up." So it was interesting. So throughout kind of the whole, let's say 2011 or I guess 2010, including the campaign to 2016. You know, I was always fighting the fight against the what uh, Boehner called the exotics. <laughs> like, you know, at the time it was like Steve King and, yeah. you know, the few people. But we were we were generally winning that battle. Right. But that so I was engaged in that battle. It was when Donald Trump came along and I it's something I actually just realized today. And I talk about in the in the book how I went to this uh, Republican retreat and got pretty hammered one night. Yeah. And uh, and I came to realize the reason mainly that that happened is. I guess this is when I started the break and I'll get to the full break, but you know, Donald Trump gets elected. We all go to Philadelphia as Republican members of Congress for this like retreat. And I start seeing my friends and people that I respected that, that went from a week ago being really concerned with Donald Trump being president to being enthused that he was being, mm. that he was president. Oh my gosh, this is great. We can do this. Genuinely He's awesome. enthused, not just pretending to be enthused. I mean, they, they internalized yeah. it. Okay. Yes, they internalized it and they, you know, they, they came to grips with he's there and now we can do all this big stuff and I may have a chance at power. That's when I started to realize like, this is going to be dangerous. Now, I don't think, by the way, any of those actually believe, for instance, the election was truly stolen. 
but some of them got really deep. And you look at somebody like a Billy Long, for instance, who was pretty moderate that ended up, you know, being one of Donald Trump's biggest fans begging for his support. But the official break, you know, I didn't vote for Trump in 16. I voted for him in 20, which is weird. I'm the only Mm -hmm. person in the country that did that. But uh, the big break obviously was January 6th, or actually it was that election and that night when Donald Trump tweeted something like, stop the vote, stop the voting, this is being stolen. And he said that night, frankly, this is being stolen. Because the thing that struck me is I realize how fragile democracies are. Yeah. And the only thing you need for it to survive is just like a basic level of trust in the electoral system. That's it. Everything else you can disagree okay, on. But, when but, you destroy but, that, yeah. it's gone. Yeah, but you you knew who Donald Trump was before yeah. that, right? So you had voted against him in 2016. You took a lot of shit for that. You voted a against lot. the first Im- impeachment. So all along, you you knew who Donald Trump was. So talk to me about the compromises you had to make. What was going on in your mind? You're thinking this guy is a complete disaster, and yet this is my team. Just talk to me yeah. about that because you you it's say like, at one, you say at one point you had gotten so much crap for voting against him in 2016. You didn't want to go through that again. Talk to yeah, me about that. Yeah, and that's. Yeah. That's the whole reason I voted for him in 2020 was, yeah. was I didn't think he'd be a good president. You know, I obviously knew he wasn't a good president. I knew what he had done with Vladimir Putin. And I, yeah. I could kind of put salve on that wound a little bit to myself by saying, well, you know, when he said Putin was great, I spoke out against it. I spoke out when he retweeted, yeah. you know, Pastor Jeffries about civil war. But I have to come to grips with the fact that, yeah, speaking out's important, but ultimately I did enable him, you know, to a certain point. And you know, you, how do you justify it? Well, again, you look back and say, well, I did speak out against him. This is my team. If I do something too big now, I'm not going to win. Somebody worse is going to replace me. You go through all of that stuff. And then ultimately it comes down to, I still wanted to be a U.S. Congress. And I knew what it took. I knew that I had to win a Republican primary in Illinois 16th district, but there was definitely that point then when it's like, you know, I, when I got back from Iraq and started to run, I said, if we're going to ask young people to be willing to die for this country, I have to be willing to give my life, you know, for existential things too. And I, I jokingly said, I thought it would be like a vote on social security reform, yeah. not necessarily <laughs> democracy, yeah. but it got to that point where I just said, I cannot be, because I don't make a commitment to any of the 700,000 people I represent. The only commitment I make yeah. is to the constitution. That's it. Okay. Let, let's just stick with this, this period of time. So you vote for him in 2020, but by January, February of 2021, you are voting uh, to impeach him. And you were one of 10 Republicans in the yeah. house, along with Liz Cheney and, and, and others who voted to impeach him. Did you think that vote was going to cost you your seat? Did you like wake up and I, you say, okay, I'm going to, I am, I'm going to strap this on me and I'm going to blow myself up or not. What do you think? I guess I didn't fully know yet if it would yeah. cost my seat because I, you know, I, I guess I was still optimistic enough to believe that a January 6th would take this guy down. Right. I mean, yeah. there was a part of me that thought, you know, maybe I'm kind of leading this new Republican party, now, leading the charge against, yeah. you know, what we used to be. But I also knew that this was not the safe thing to do. And, but I knew that it was, this was the thing that was worth it. And, you know, the, I, I think I've said with you before, the day before the impeachment vote, I thought we'd hit 25, you know, people mm-hmm. like Mike yeah. Gallagher who were, yeah. you know, and even, uh, uh, yeah, Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin, yeah. even Nancy Mace was going to be a yes. And then they started to express to me their concern about reelection. And that's when I knew I was excited to get 10 at that point. So I guess in a way I did know it would cost me, I, but I certainly had no idea that if you'd have told me, I remember Fred Upton once telling me shortly after that, that he thought Trump was going to run again. And I thought he was insane. I'm like, there's no way he's, I mean, come on, you know, See, this guy did yeah. a January 6th. See, this is what, this is interesting because every once in a while we encounter people um, on the other side of the aisle who will say, well, this was all inevitable. Nothing surprising about this at all. But the reality is that for a lot of Republicans, they did think maybe they didn't have to vote for impeachment because surely this was it for Donald Trump, right? So yeah. how ama- how surprising is it? I mean, you watched up close and personal. How surprising is it to have watched what has happened, n- not just, and we, we could go back to 2015, what's happened to the conservative movement and, and the Republican Party, but let's just focus on this. Since January 7th, 2021, 
the decision that Kevin McCarthy made, the decision that Elise Stefanik made, the decision that one Republican after another has made, the fact that Mike Pence was dead on arrival because the one courageous thing that he, that he did became the unforgivable sin. So just talk to me about it because I, I think that even the Ron DeSantis of the world are kind of looking around going, are you kidding me? After January yeah, yeah. 6th, after all of the indictments, the guy is still dominant in this party. He is still the apex predator. I mean, how amazing is this? Yeah, I, it is amazing. And I think, look, it, it's amazing because I know these people. Yeah. You know, let's take Mitch McConnell, who I think in his heart is a decent guy. I think he means well. He's a he's a tactician. And I think mm -hmm. he thought, boy, the best thing I can do is not remove Donald Trump because he's gone anyway. He's dead I can anyway. Preserve my yeah. majority. He's dead anyway. You know, but if he's the reason that Donald Trump didn't get removed, right? It's all these decisions that were made. The person that surprised me the most, Charlie, is still Kevin McCarthy because mm. I I knew Kevin as, I mean, his big thing was he wanted to put the Republican Party on the map for climate change. He wanted mm. the Republican Party to wow. be the party of Silicon Valley. Like he mm. had all these like kind of, you know, progressive politically, not actually progressive, but progressive politically ideas. And then he sold it all out for Trump. And the biggest surprise, of course, was when he showed up to Mar-a-Lago and resurrected him. And I think, yeah, like on the Ron DeSantis side, when he started running, I think he said, I'm going to beat Donald Trump because Donald Trump's going to be gone. Right. But I can maintain that thing people love about him. But he doesn't go away. And no. part of the reason, Charlie, is because the second tier influencers, which is everybody that's on the stage running for president of the United States, is who people also look to for opinions. And when every one of them, including Mike Pence, by the way, says that this is a witch hunt against Donald Trump and the yeah. DOJ is a two tier justice system, system of justice, with the exception of Chris Christie saying that, there's no doubt people are going to believe it then because yeah. everybody else they trust is saying the same thing Trump is. So you, this this book begins, you open the book in the introduction with the, the fiasco of Kevin McCarthy's rise to the speakership, the fact that it took the 15 votes, the fact that he may had to make these compromises with all of the, the crazies. And between the time you wrote that and, and now, of course, we've seen the spectacular fall of Kevin McCarthy, which in so many ways was for foreordained, right? I mean, it was, it was predictable from the, the weakness. So, so let's just talk about that. You're, you, you watch Kevin McCarthy, um, make those compromises, decide to go down and kiss the ring at Mar-a-Lago because he thought that was going to save him. That was going to give him the majority. And here we are today. How do we get here? Yeah, here we are today. Here we are today. And by the way, had, had Kevin not done that and had he actually pushed back against Trump and had like Pence led the charge against Trump, we, we'd be in a much different place. But yeah, I mean, it's it's that's just that moment we're in where it's like, OK, everything is confused. Everybody's lost. Everybody's everybody's where they are. And actually, I just kind of totally forgot what I was saying. What was your point again? No, no, no. I mean, so I, 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 how, my... how, how did we you know? How did we get here? You know, with Kevin McCarthy? I mean, we've gone from. Oh, what yeah, we yeah. thought was we thought was the dysfunction of the 15 ballots for Kevin McCarthy. And now we have the fifth string speaker who you've described as Jim Jordan in, in, in drag, who is clearly <laughs> still Matt Gates's right? Um, yeah. but, but, I, but I mean, a full throated election but, denier, somebody, I mean, you sat on the January 6th committee. Here is somebody who was right front and center in Donald Trump's attempts to overthrow the election. So we thought things were bad and, and the Kevin McCarthy yeah. was weak. And now we've gone to the fifth string, Mike Johnson. How did we get here? Well, so like, let's take the, like, who's the most powerful person in a room? So let's say you put 10 of us in a room. Everybody yeah. has a hand grenade. Okay. Yeah. We're all equally powerful. If one person is willing to pull the pen and drop the grenade, they're the most powerful person in the room, right? It doesn't matter how tall yeah. you are. It doesn't matter right. how much political power you have. And that's what we have enabled in the Republican party for a long time. If you see the stuff that we saw with this battle for speaker, None of it was new. None of the dynamics were new. They were always kind of yeah. the, we'll call them the moderates. They're not moderate, but they're moderate in, in tone. The moderates, there was always the crazy caucus and then the kind of 80% that just wanted to just survive. That's always existed. The difference is now it was put out in public. When Kevin had to cut, because he had such a narrow majority, he had to cut all those things. He basically got in a room with everybody that pulled the pin on a grenade. And set, and they all had different goals. Yeah. And he yeah. said, okay, if you put the pins back, you know, whatever. And mm -hmm. then, so his death, his political death was inevitable. Then the fact that we got to a point where the only way you would be a, 
even viable candidate for speaker was to deny the election. And that was split screen on the news with Jenna Ellis tearfully speaking the fact that she lied to the American people about the very same thing. The fact that there were like four people that have already taken plea agreements. The fact that everybody knows Donald Trump is guilty. But yet the thing, the only thing that could qualify you for speaker to start is that you basically were contradicting what these people were confessing to. That's the moment we're in. So Mike Johnson, and this is like, I think I kind of predicted this when his name was floated, but I, I'm not, I'm not positive. Mm-hmm. I said, look, I was, I was very impressed. The moderates pushed back against Jordan because I thought yeah. they would capitulate. Right. They, they helped, yeah. but I knew they couldn't do it minutes. twice. Yeah. They helped for five minutes. You yeah. couldn't do it twice. Mike Johnson, by the way, I remember, I didn't know him well, but I remember him coming up to me, trying to get me to sign on to this lawsuit, you know, for Texas. The, and I'm just like, Mike, the totally bogus Texas lawsuit that would have thrown out totally. all of the votes of everybody in Wisconsin, for example. Yeah. I mean, yep. and, and by the way, a little known fact about that, Kevin McCarthy and Liz Cheney had a conversation and Liz is like, Kevin, you're not signing that. Right. And he's like, Oh, of course not Liz. That's crazy. Yeah. So the next day the did. list comes out, Kevin's not on it. And he puts out a press release and says, I was inadvertently left off. That's the kind of courage Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, those those I am their leader. Those are my people. I need to uh, I, I need I need to go after them. So, um, yeah, the, the the so Mike Johnson's one of his first things that he's doing is um, and I want to get back to the other the, the, the bigger picture. But I know you had some thoughts on on this. So, you know, the, the question of what kind of a speaker he would be. Um, he's made it clear that he will um, you know not vote on Ukraine aid uh, and is in the Israel aid package. You know, he, he he's decoupling those two aid packages. But. He's also playing this stupid game now with the Israel aid package, at least this morning, saying that he um, wants to offset the cost by slashing um, IRS enforcement, which would actually increase the deficit. What do you think about that? Well, so first off, on just the splitting the aid, it's dumb. And, I, you know, I think Mike is trying to figure out how to lead now at the same time because he's kind of given multiple feelings on this. But on the Israel stuff, he's yeah. actually – Tactically, I think this is dumb just tactically because it's going to give an excuse for the Senate to vote no. And yes, I would have voted will. no on this package, by yeah. the way. They'll really? vote no, and now they'll be able to jam the House with uh, with multiple, with, you know, what, what frankly needs to be done, which is Ukraine and Israel. And this is just, this is par for the course. It actually does surprise me, though, a little bit because I would have thought that they would have done at least Israel aid without any offsets. Right. The fact that right. they're offsetting with the IRS. What it goes to show, Charlie, is how unserious they are. Because yes. why? Yeah. It's the IRS, of course. Because you can go on Fox News and attack the IRS. It's a great that's why they're point. using the IRS. Yeah, yeah. but that's I mean, it, it, it is. the, the unser- and I wrote about this in my newsletter. The unseriousness is that it's a great talking point for the base, but it doesn't actually offset the cost. They pick the one spending cut that will actually blow up the deficit by thirty billion dollars. Okay. Yeah. So let's take a deep breath and, and 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 go back because your book is is a memoir of how you got here, um, your personal story and the personal story and and, and it, it it is it is a great read. But what I think is also interesting, as I as I said right at the beginning, is is the is the confessional. And of course, you know, you know that there are people, uh, the progressives, who say, you know, um, well, where's the apology? Where's the acknowledgement of complicity? Well, you 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 do that. In the book, you do write that you feel some responsibility for people like Marjorie Taylor Greene because you didn't fight the good fight the whole time. Um, you, you write that you, you didn't traffic in hate, but you do say that you were part of the system that did. Talk to me yeah. about that, because I think a lot of a lot of people and I would certainly put myself in this category. You knew this stuff was going on over there, but you figured, eh, you know, why make an issue of it? They're allies. That's the crazy uncle in the corner. And we didn't confront the extremists and the bigots. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly right. Because, you know, to an extent, it was this idea of it's coalition, right? Yeah, we're going to have the crazies, the bigots, the extremists. They're voting Republican. They're going to yeah. vote for me in the primary, maybe. And they're going to vote for me in the general election. And so, you know, if somebody says something that's, I don't know, racist or insane, instead of pushing back like John McCain did, for instance, when the lady called uh, Obama Muslim, you just kind of chuckle or shake your head or just say, like, I'll look into that. I mean, that was the favorite one. It's like, hey, did you know that, yeah. you know, the UN's going to kill all Christians? It's like, oh, really? I didn't know. I'll look into that. Right. And you look at like, do I consider myself pushing those theories? No. But could I have pushed back harder? Yes. Could I have, you know, 
gone on Fox News specifically for a hit saying that Jade Helm, which was this conspiracy theory in 2015, Ooh. that Obama was going to take over Texas, that it was yeah. false. I could have. Did I do yeah. that? No, because I only wanted to go on Fox News for hits that actually sure. the Fox News viewers would like. And so, right. yeah, all of that comes into play. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember that as well. We, you know, we laughed at it. We rolled our eyes. But like, why spend any time? Because you don't have to worry about that, right? And we want to come back to this because I keep thinking about all the times that we should have pushed back against that, but but we rationalized not doing it. We would tell ourselves it's just a small number of people. It's not that important. And but we'll get to that. So you spent a lot of your time in growing up in, in rural Illinois. I mean, and mm -hmm. one of the great stories of our time has been this dramatic shift of rural voters from the the Democratic Party to the Republican Party or more or more re Republican. Give me some sense of what is going on, because you write about this in, in the book that, you know, across the Midwest, places like West Virginia, you know, what happened after 2008? I mean, 2008 yeah. in 20, oh, during the, the Great Recession, the opioid ep epidemic. What happened? So if you look at um you know, first off, you can start with the 90s with the disappearance of manufacturing, right? And of course, the Midwest, where you and I are from, heavy yeah. manufacturing area. And that's actually made a pretty significant comeback. But still, yeah. you know, it's it's taken some damage compared to what it was. And and you have a lot of people in their 50s that were trained in the manufacturing that, you know, lose their jobs and they're they're almost too old to go retrain or they think they're too old to go retrain. And society seems to kind of push them aside and yeah, we can give them unemployment benefits, and yeah. but that doesn't make you feel like a useful person. And so people were turning to drugs, right? That's why you had a huge opioid epidemic, particularly in places like West Virginia and the Midwest. And 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 then all of a sudden, the economy collapses, and probably rightfully, you know, that you had to bail out the banks to keep the financial institution alive. But the perception, also rightfully, was that you know, Washington only cared about the big banks and not the little person. Right. And so there was this growing resentment, plus the fact that any of the media you watch portrayed Christians, for instance, as, you know, crazy people or mm -hmm. out of touch or superstitious. It betrayed the, you know, the values of San Francisco or New York City. And so Donald Trump comes along, and I guess the saddest thing is he's the biggest con artist of all of anything. But he comes along and he knows enough, in your words, in his lizard brain, to put lizard brain to put words to that angst people are feeling. So he tells West Virginia, "We're going to return. We're going to put you back in the coal yeah. business," which of course he never did. Yeah, yeah. We're going to return your factories. These people over there, they suck. And he put a voice to that, and that's why I think we've seen this massive shift. I mean, I have an uncle that used to kind of brag that he would vote Democratic sometimes. It's now yeah. one of Trump's biggest supporters because he just put voice to that. And so that's what I think a big thing is that happened. I, this is this is an important point because, you know, and, and again, you you write about this. You know, these people felt unheard. Um, they didn't see themselves portrayed. They thought they were being looked down upon. And the people were looking for somebody with an inspirational message. So these were people who looked at Ronald Reagan, looked at Barack Obama, who addressed their isolation. They felt they were heard by them. But you're right. What they got was a person who turned that isolation into hate. And Trump gave people a license to say racist things, anti-immigrant things, anti-Semitic things. He basically also said, you are not responsible for this. He came up with, and again, this is, there's a long history to this saying, you know, blame these people. It's the immigrants. It's those people. And somehow that connected. The Democrats look at this and they go, well, hold on, hold on. These are people who should be voting for, you know, voted for you know, FDR, who voted for Lyndon Johnson, who voted for John F. Kennedy and Harry Truman. They voted for Barack Obama. Why are they not listening to us right now? We are the party of the working class and the little man. And yet that's not the way it played out in the Midwest. And and my sense it's is not, there are still a lot of Democrats that don't understand this. I, and there are. There yeah. are because, and I don't know where the shift happened, but at some point the Democrats went from, think of like a Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. who basically spoke blue collar language, to where we are today, and look, Democrats get upset at me for saying this. If but you Joe, want. Joe you Biden's a blue, blue collar, collar guy, yeah, but but yep. Joe Biden speaks blue collar, right? Yeah, he does, he does, and you know his he's up against the fact that again, some people are willing to use the fire of anger that he's not willing to yeah. use, and you know if if Joe Biden decided, which he wouldn't, because I don't think his soul would allow it to become anti-immigrant and blame the Mexicans, yeah. maybe he'd gain some ground among this. Or if he had the ability, which I think is is tough for him, maybe it's an advanced age, maybe it's just not natural, 
to basically inspire and saying, you know, a different thing, then that's possible. But, you know, when you, when you have a party that what they don't necessarily embrace it, but they tolerate Talib, for instance, blaming Israel for bombing yeah. in Gaza when it's completely untrue, um, you know, this defund the police, get mad at me for it. But there still is a perception that the Democratic Party is against funding the police. That's not yeah. my problem. That's yeah. a Democratic problem. That's something that's very important to the middle class voters in areas where you and I come from. And uh, right. And the other thing is just, look, everybody in their heart has a battle daily between like light and dark, right? And it's easy to let darkness overtake you. Right. And when a man stands in front of you and whispers the dark parts of your heart and gives you permission to use those dark parts of right. your heart, it overtakes. And that's what's happened. Yeah, no, and, and and I think that's a crucial point. But a lot of these these folks, you know, if, if you appeal to the better, better angels of their nature, um, they would, you know, it's a, you don't want to be that person. You don't want to have these these views. They would respond to that. But but what's happened is that they have tapped they have tapped into it. So you you had an event in New York, and you're there. And by the way, you're a family man. This is this is this is great. This is yeah, reality. Yeah, you get to hear, hear the this hear is the baby this crying. is reality <laughs> podcast. I, I have a dog here. You have you know because you're a you're a young dad. So yeah. let's talk about the tea party. Because yeah, th yeah. this is always this is fascinating to me the, the the way the Tea Party has morphed and the role that it played. You said in in New York the Tea Party had been the weird table at GOP events, but now the more extreme <laughs> you can be yeah. has become the essence of how Republicans show themselves to be conservative. Now it's not what you believe; it's become about being the craziest person in the room, the most extreme person in the room. So, for example, in the, on the abortion issue. Well, you know, an abortion ban at 15 weeks. No, you have to say an abortion ban at six weeks. So the Tea Party, I mean, you know, I, I thought the Tea Party was a legit thing in the beginning. It was interesting yeah, it was. to watch how it became a grift, how it became extreme. And it became about something completely different than we thought it was about. Right. You know, the first Tea Party event I went to was in New Lenox, Illinois, and yeah. there were eight or 10,000 people that showed yeah. up. Yeah. So you think about that. What was that? What were those eight or 10,000 people? They were folks that were upset with Obamacare. They were upset with government spending. They were basically Republicans. I mean, that's yeah. just what they, it was just a large group of Republicans that, that, you know, that were having their voice heard. And, and when the GOP won the majority, the vast majority of them said, okay, we did our job and they went home. The problem is these organizations that were formed uh, continued. And so I would go to tea party meetings after that, that would have a thousand and then 500 and then it would end up like 20 people there. And what you had was this paring down of the normals to the extremes that finally, for the first time had a, you know, what they felt like people were paying attention to them and their crazy ideas. And that became the tea party. It like, look, I was considered a tea party darling in 2010. Right. I never once And I even proactively pushed back against the idea of voting against increasing the debt one. I said, no, of course you have to increase the debt limit. Everybody's like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Can you imagine saying that in front of a Tea Party now? Yeah. And it just goes to show how it evolved from just normal kind of upset conservatives I, to what it is today. I remember it just in real time watching this, and I know that there'll be listeners who will say, you know, oh, this was all astroturfing. It was all the Koch brothers or whatever. Um, maybe uh, eventually it became that, but it starts off as as a movement, and then it becomes this, this racket. I think there's a famous quote about this, and it became this organized grift that was dominated by the, the, the extremists, which in many ways followed the trajectory of the Republican Party. I mean, I remember yeah. how the Tea Party Express for about five minutes was actually, you know, anti Donald Trump because they kind of recognized that he had nothing to do with what they were talking about. He was not interested in fiscal responsibility. He was the king of debt and everything. But of course, like everybody else, they flipped. They flipped the switch. Yes. They became something else because the script demanded we don't actually care about entitlements or about deficits or about debt. We care about who's going to give us these dopamine hits. And, and that, and that, and that's how. It's so much of the media and so much of the organized Republican Party and, and, and the that ecosystem around it became right. It became more and more intense, more performative. And by the way, with dopamine hits comes money, right? Yeah. Because if you can if you can tickle that zone, people will write you a check. If you can make them fear for the life. They'll write you a check. And yes, you know, politics will become Hollywood, not just in the fact that people can become famous now and well known. It's become Hollywood in that it is a high profit business. <laughs> 
you know, it used to be you'd raise enough money. I think my first campaign, yeah. I, I raised and spent a million and a half bucks. That wouldn't get you through a state house race in Illinois wow. now. And that because was a lot of money, money has become, yeah, it was a lot of money then. And so, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's with the Tea Party, they, they, the Tea Party Express, they claim that they're about fiscal conservatism. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, everybody's getting into this cult and loving what this guy is saying. And then it's like, oh, that's how we can raise the cash. I sat in the Oval Office and heard Donald Trump say, um, yeah, we have to, you know, reform entitlements and reform Social Security next next uh, term. And I remember thinking to myself, that's going to last to his very first speech when he sees the blue hairs in the crowd and just says to them, oh, I'm never going to touch your Social Security. And yeah, Charlie, yeah. that's exactly what yeah, happened this, this because he didn't did care about ideas. No, he never did. So let, let's look at let's look ahead. Um, is is our system prepared for what's going to happen in 2024? I know you've given a lot of thought to this. We now know that Speaker Mike Johnson is going to be presiding over the certification of the 2024 election. We know what the passions are going to be, the trials, everything. You know, this is the ultimate stress test for democracy, yeah. isn't it? It is. I look, I look forward to 2028 and say I think it's going to be an amazing election cycle because there's going to have all new faces and all new energy. This yeah. one I worry about. And, you know, we can have these guardrails in democracy, you know, like off an interstate, for instance, and your yeah. car can hit guardrails and stay on the bridge and yeah. not fall into the river. If a second car comes along and hits that same guardrail, it's going to take it off the road and you're going to fall into the river. And the problem is, is now Trump and the Trump type folks have learned where the weaknesses are in the system. They accidentally tested the system. I think intentionally tested it but accidentally tested the weak points in 2020. And I think now they're going to know exactly where the weak points are. And if Donald Trump wins, and by the way, anybody that thinks this is a done deal that, you know, that uh, Trump can't win, if it, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people that just kind of scoff when I say, take him seriously. If they think he can't win, listen, he can win again. Nobody thought he could win in 2016. And I'm going to tell you, if he does get through and he wins this time, he's going to interview a hundred candidates for attorney general and only take the one that says, like, Mr. President, I'm, in essence, I don't care what the Constitution is. I'm going to do whatever you want as your servant in the Department of Justice. That person is going to get selected to be attorney general. And we're going to find a system that is stressed beyond what even the founding fathers imagined it could be stressed to. Who's he going to pick for a vice president, do you think? Oh, man, I don't. I You know, it's going to be somebody like. Christy Nome or Elise Stefanik, I, I think. think yeah. uh, I think Nancy Mace is auditioning for it. Mm, yeah, I think it's going to be somebody that, yeah, I think it's going to be somebody that probably female and somebody that shows an absolute uh, loyalty to him no matter what. And unfortunately, there's a huge list of people. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be shocked if it was Elise Stefanik. Okay, so where are you now, Adam? You spent your whole political career as a conservative Republican. You've broken with your party. Talk to me about being out in the political wilderness, because there there are there are some folks who feel that okay, if you break with, with Trump, you must you now must become a liberal Democrat. What, right? Where, where 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 are you? How how do you describe yourself? Where are you? At? Oh well, I would consider myself politically the same kind of I'd say center right, you know, moderate on some things, mm -hmm. conservative on others. That I've always been. I've I've had to come to peace with the fact that I don't need to be a member of a tribe because uh, neither tribe I feel like I'm fully represented by. Um, I've found new allies in the Democratic Party on the issue of democracy. Uh, but I also recognize that Democrats have to fight that fight within their party, too, because there are some illiberal elements within it. Um, so I don't know. I just consider myself homeless. I'm maintaining the, uh, the label of Republican because to me, I don't want to lose it. I don't want to give it up. I think it's important to maintain and to fight for. But I voted Democratic last election cycle, and if it's Trump against Biden, I intend to vote Democratic again. Because, Charlie, I think there's only one thing on the ballot, at least in my mind, which yeah. is do you support authoritarianism or democracy? And there's only one party that supports democracy. Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, Country First, um, the organization you founded, which backs pro-democracy candidates. You, you back pro-democracy candidates who are both Republicans and Democrats at this point. How complicated yeah, is that? Yeah, so our it, it is complicated, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, because it violates how everybody's thought of politics. But our only requirement is that you put the country above the party, particularly if you're called to do so at the cost of your own career. Uh, we've started an academy that basically, because I get 
And you probably get this too. A lot of people come up and say like, how do I start into journalism or how do I start into politics? Yeah. I get that a lot. How do I run for office? And so we're trying to teach people, here's what you have to do to run for office. Yeah. Here's the considerations. We do really good at institutional democracy building overseas. And I've come to now realize we have to do that at home. So that's what Country First is trying to do is to be a democracy building organization at home. But I'd encourage people to go to country1st.com, the number one st.com, and uh, take a look at what we're doing. Okay. Well, one, one last question of is I put this in my newsletter today and I expect to get a lot of reaction to it. You have your own Substack newsletter, which you devoted today to a warning to Democrats. You said that you have a problem and it is the the number of radicals who are pro Hamas. Now, talk to me about this because this is kind of circling back because my my sense is reading that is that you're remembering what we talked about earlier, which is our failure on the right to police our whack you know uh, whack jobs the ex- the extremists the way we rationalize they're part of the coalition they are our allies they're not that important and you know as a result look where we're at now so tell me why you decided that you were going to warn the Democrats um, how serious a problem do they have with this because they will say they there's no problem there's no problem we're all behind Joe Biden on Israel you know? you know the number of Democratic Jewish friends I have that I have sent some of these things that have been said by other Democrats yeah. to, uh, they're surprised. They're not seeing this for some reason. Yeah. And, you know, what we live through, I remember being in Congress and having, you know, Dana Rohrbacher be pro-Russia mm. and thinking that was insane. People like, oh, well, that's just Dana Rohrbacher. Right. And then, you know, some people come along and you get, a, you know, Matt Gates kind of says something pro-Russian and like, ah, the, and now I'd say over 50% of the party is at least Russian adjacent, sympathetic. Yeah. That happened very quickly. And, yeah. When under 30 years old of the self-identified Democrats are expressing more support for Palestinians and Hamas than they are in Israel, that's a problem. That's a ticking time bomb, literally. And I think Democrats have to take it seriously. This is not a, a you know an attack by a Republican against Democrats. This is a warning from a Republican that has seen what's happened to his own party to Democrats to say, we've got to have one healthy party in you know, you guys are starting to cough a little bit and you need to, you know, go take your zinc or whatever and prevent this from happening. Okay. So what, what, what do they have to do? What do they have to do about these, these, these extremes who right now seem like they're isolated in the fever swamps? I think keep them isolated and speak out when Rashida Tlaib, you know, for instance, blames Israel for bombing something that is quite obvious later, they didn't bomb the Democrats, just like they called on every Republican to do Every time Donald Trump said something, the Democrats have to disavow that and say, you know, we can't stop somebody. We had an open Nazi that would run as a Republican in Illinois every year. We couldn't stop that because all you have to do is get on the ballot. Democrats can't stop somebody from being a Democrat, but they can say that doesn't represent our values. And particularly pushing back in these colleges and universities that are poisoning the mind of young people to believe that it's okay to murder 1,400 people as long as it's in the name of anti-colonialism. If they speak out to that, I can't guarantee you're going to win that fight, but I guarantee you're going to do everything you can to win it, unlike what we've done. Adam Kinzinger's new book is Renegade, Defending Democracy and Liberty in Our Divided Country. It is out today. Um, Adam is also a senior political commentator for CNN and, uh, as we just discussed, founded Country First, which backs pro-democracy candidates. So, Adam congratulations on the book and best of luck. Thanks. I appreciate it. Good to be with you. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again.